it's like, I'll just make a video, Trisha. Yeah. And so, like, all right, hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, people will still trickle in, but I think we're pretty much at max capacity right now, which is always good. Um, so welcome to the third annual Poetry Out Loud final competition. I'm Justin Tackett, and this is Abigail Droge, and we're just a couple of the members from the Poetry Out Loud committee, and we thank you all for coming. Um, first, since the impact of this evening greatly depends upon sound and listening, we'd like to ask everyone right now to please take out your cell phones and turn them all off, especially because we're recording as well. So it'd be really nice if we don't interrupt anyone. Okay. So the purpose of this evening is to return to poetry's roots, to return to a vocal experience that creates, even if only temporarily, a community of listeners. As American poet Lucille Clifton once said, poetry began when somebody walked off a savanna or out of a cave and looked up at the sky with wonder and said, ah. <laughs> that was the first poem. The urge towards ah is very human. It's in everybody, she said. Tonight, then, we're all going back to the savannah to find that, ah, making poetry again an event that is unique and fleeting. For the last two years, Poetry Out Loud has been a wonderful success, and poem selections have ranged geographically across the Anglophone world and temporally from Shakespeare half a millennium ago to contemporary poets who are still living. This year, we are excited to present a dynamic program that includes 19th century classics alongside poems from the Harlem Renaissance and poets who have ranged from the German-born Charles Bukowski to San Francisco native Sharon Olds. We invite you to reflect on the ahs that each performer makes, which will challenge us to think of poetry a little differently. The emphasis tonight, therefore, is on words and voices. More Stanford students entered the qualifying round than ever before this year, and we wish we could have included them all tonight. But rest assured that the 10 finalists before you this evening have endured some very tough competition from their colleagues. This year's tryouts again confirmed that poetry is alive and well at Stanford, and that interest in poetry knows no degree or disciplinary boundaries, as you'll see from your program. And we especially welcome back our friends from the sciences, um, you're giving us humanities folks a run for our money, literally. Um, in fact, tonight's top prizes are $400, $250, and $150, which I'm sure will make everything just a little more exciting. <laughs> so before we begin, some thank yous are in order, as always, to the Stanford English and Creative Writing Departments for making tonight possible, especially Gavin Jones, Evan Boland, Judy Kandel, Laura Ma, Nicole Bridges, Katie Dooling, wherever she went, she was in the back. Anyway, Katie Dooling, wherever she is in spirit. Um, Christina Ablaza, and everyone um, in the English department in any capacity who helped promote, uh, promote this event. We'd also like to thank our fellow committee members who are here uh, tonight, Mary Kim, Linda Liu, Rukma Sen, and Sarah Weston, for their help in putting together um, tonight. And last but not least, We'd like to thank uh, our illustrious judge, uh, who we have with us, Keith Eckes, esteemed lecturer in poetry here in the Creative Writing Department and former Sanger Fellow um, in poetry. And now, unfortunately, is the time to make the announcement that the other judge, Terry Castle, has caught the flu. And she is not here tonight. Um, so we wish her well in her recovery, and uh, she'll be missed. Uh, so now we want to get the competition started. So we'll introduce each competitor, um, which will be his or her cue to come to the front of the room. And they have memorized their poems, but may have an assistant help them if they forget a line. Uh, so the assistant will sit over there where the pink reserved tag is. Um, when all ten finalists have performed, the judges will, or the judge, um, <laughs> will retire to make his decision. Um, and the rest of us will help ourselves to refreshments on the terrace. <laughs> Um, when Keith re-enters, uh, we will again take our seats, and he will offer some feedback on the performances, um, and then declare our three winners. So without further ado, please find a comfortable position, open your ears, and let's get the competition started. So please welcome to the front of the room our first performer, Monica Tiu. Monica is a sophomore in psychology, and she will be performing an almost made-up poem by Charles Bukowski. Because um, especially 
Kowski and also I guess for me. Um, it's really personal to reveal your body to someone, but I feel that this makes the statement that revealing your heart. I see you drinking at a fountain with tiny blue hands. No, your hands are not tiny. They are small, and the fountain is in France, where you wrote me that last letter, and I answered and never heard from you again. You used to write insane poems about angels and God, all in uppercase. And you knew famous artists, and most of them were your lovers. And I wrote back, it's all right. Go ahead, enter their lives. I'm not jealous, because we've never met. We got close once in New Orleans, one half block, never met, never touched. So you went with the famous and wrote about the famous and, of course, what you found out is that the famous are worried about their fame, not the beautiful young girl in bed with them who gives them that, and then awakens in the morning to write uppercase poems about angels and God. We know God is dead. They've told us. But listening to you, I wasn't sure. You were one of the best female poets, and I told the publishers, editors, print her, print her. She's mad, but she's magic. There's no lie in her fire. I loved you like a man loves a woman he never touches only writes to, keeps little photographs of. I would have loved you more if I had sat in a small room rolling a cigarette and listened to you piss in the bathroom. But that didn't happen. Your letters got sad. Your lovers betrayed you. Kid, I wrote back, all lovers betray. It didn't help. You said you had a crying bench, and it was by a bridge, and the bridge was over a river, and you sat on the crying bench every night and wept for the lovers who had hurt and forgotten you. I wrote back, but never heard again. A friend wrote me of your suicide three or four months after it happened. If I had met you, I would probably have been unfair to you or you. It was best like this. Thank you, Monica. Uh, next we have Paul Carroll, a junior in the computer science department, who will be performing excerpts from T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Cooper. Um, I know that we have some people by the door. You can sort of uh, filter in and so I fell in love with our quarter uh, with a girl who lives on my floor, and I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know how to ask her out, 
That seems like a very like evolutionary thing to be able to do, to like ask someone out, but I didn't know how. <laughs> so what I did was I took this poem and I wrote it all out on pieces of printer paper and it actually took up eight sheets of printer paper and I put them on my door so that every time I would go into my room I would see this poem and I would be ashamed of myself for not having <laughs> asked her out. <laughs> and I did eventually ask her out and she said no. But <laughs> I think the important lesson of the poem is that what matters ultimately is being able to presume and being able to forget. So this is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out across the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his legs and arms are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute, there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So, how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on a wall, then how shall I begin to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways? And how shall I presume? And I have known the arms already. I've known them all. Arms that are white and soft and bare, but in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table, or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets, and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves, leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. In the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, asleep, quiet, or it malingers, here on the floor, stretched beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet. And here's no great matter, I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, setting a pillow by her head, should say, 
That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord. One that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse. At times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost, at times, the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk along the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them, riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the wave blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us, and we drown. standard on which we base all American life, and that's the American dream. That's sort of our, our goal, the thing that we work towards, and the thing that we try to rectify in all, in all, in all of our choices. Uh, but the problem that he faced then, and the problem that we still face now, is that the American dream is not an equal opportunity provider. So this is Let America Be America Again by Langston. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dream has dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme. Let any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real, and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me. No freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that pulls your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from this land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog and mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and of hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean. Hungry yet today despite the dream. Beaten yet today, O oh pioneer, I am the man that never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings. A, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrow turn that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. Yes, I'm the man who left Dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's glad grassy lee. 
And torn from black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamt and all the songs we've sung. All the, all the hopes we've held. All the flags we've hung. For the millions with nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that is mine. The poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. Who made America. Whose sweat and blood. Whose faith and pain. Whose hand at the foundry. Whose plow in the rain. Must bring back our mighty dream again. So. Call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain, America has never been America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plains, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and bring back America again. It dazes you and 
it asks nothing. A name tag, a few trinkets, it is what the dead clothes on. Finally, I imagine them shutting their mouths on it, like a communion tablet. The tulips are too red in the first place. They hurt me. Even through the gift paper, I could hear them breathe lightly through their white swaddlings like an awful baby. Their redness talks to my wound. It corresponds. They are subtle. They seem to float, though they weigh me down, upsetting me with their sudden tongues and their color. A dozen red lead sinkers round my neck. Nobody watched me before. Now I am watched. The tulips turn to me, and the window behind me, where once a day the light slowly widens and slowly thins. And I see myself flat, ridiculous, a cut paper shadow between the eye of the sun and the eyes of the tulips. And I have no face. I have wanted to efface myself. The tulips eat my oxygen. Before they came, the air was calm enough, coming and going, breath by breath, without any fuss. Then the tulips filled it up like a loud noise. <coughs> They have caught my attention that was happy, playing and resting without committing itself. The walls also seem to be warming themselves. The tulips should be behind bars like dangerous animals. They are opening like the mouth of some great African cat. And I am aware of my heart. It opens and closes its bowl of red blooms out of sheer love of me. The water I taste is warm and salt, like the sea. It comes from a country far away as hell. Not many people know Margaret Atwood writes poetry. Um, I actually discovered this in high school when she was coming to speak at my town. Um, like any good high schooler, I decided I didn't want to read a whole book, so I googled to see if she had any poems online. Um, <laughs> and though I have since read some of her books, I still really, really, really like this poem. Um, so this is Helen of Troy, just countertop dancing by Margaret Atwood. The world is full of women who tell me I should be ashamed of myself if they had the chance. Quit dancing. Get some self-respect and a day job. Right. And a minimum wage. And varicose veins just standing in one place for eight hours behind a glass counter, bundled up to the neck instead of naked as a meat sandwich. Selling gloves or something. Instead of what I do sell. You have to have talent to peddle the things so nebulous and without material form. Exploited, they'd say. Yes, any way you cut it, but I have a choice of how and I'll take the money. I do give value. Like preachers, I sell vision. Like perfume ads, desire. Or it's facsimile. Like jokes or war, it's all in the timing. I sell men back their worst suspicions, that everything's for sale and piecemeal. They gaze at me and see a chainsaw murder just before it happens, when thigh, ass, inkblot, crevice, tit, and nipple are still connected. Such hatred leaps in them, my beery worshippers. That, or a bleary, hopeless love. Looking over the rows of heads and upturned eyes, imploring, 
but ready to snap at my ankles. I understand floods and earthquakes and the urge to step on ants. I keep the beat and dance for them because they can't. The music smells like foxes, crisp as heated metal searing the nostrils, or humid as August, hazy and languorous as a looted city the day after, when all the rape's been done already, and the killing, and the survivors wander around looking for garbage to eat, and there's only a bleak exhaustion. Speaking of which, it's the smiling that tires me out the most. This and the pretense that I can't hear them. And I can't. Because I'm, after all, a foreigner to them. The speech here is all warty guttural, as obvious as a slab of ham. But I come from the province of the gods, where meanings are lilting and oblique. I don't let on to everyone, but lean close and I'll whisper. My mother was raped by a holy swan. You believe that? You can take me out to dinner. That's what we tell all the husbands. There sure are a lot of dangerous birds around. <laughs> Not that anyone here but you would understand. The rest of them would like to watch me and feel nothing. Reduce me to components, as in a clock factory or abattoir. Crush out the mystery. Wall me up alive in my own body. They'd like to see through me, but nothing is more opaque than absolute transparency. Look, my feet don't hit the marble. Like breath or a balloon, I'm rising. I hover six inches in the air in my blazing swan egg of light. You think I'm not a goddess? Try me. This is a torch song. Touch me and you'll burn. Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore for the rare and radiant maiden who the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger. Hesitating then, no longer, sir, said I, or madam, truly, your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. Silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, 
and the echo murmured back the word. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lacks. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, and with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped the stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace, just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling through the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling straight, I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more, I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er she shall press uh, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfume from an unseen censer swung by <coughs> seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels, he hath sent thee respite, respite, and nepenthe from my memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this quiet nepenthe, and forget thy lost Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted on this home by a horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, of bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden who the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden who the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of the lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid busted palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of the demons that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted never. myself a pretty positive person. And uh, Charles Bukowski is not a positive person. Um, but I think his, his cynicism has some wisdom. Uh, you know, not, not everybody has your best interests at heart all the time. Um, and if you're going to get stepped on, it's sort of helpful to expect the flip. Um, so, anyway. <laughs> a woman, a tire that's flat, a disease, a desire, 
fears in front of you. Fears that hold so still you can study them like pieces on a chessboard. It's not the large things that send a man to the madhouse. Death he's ready for, or murder, incest, robbery, fire, flood. No, it's the continuing series of small tragedies that send a man to the madhouse. Not the death of his love, but the shoelace that snaps from time left. The dread of life is that swarm of trivialities that can kill quicker than cancer and that are always there. License plates or taxes or expired driver's license. Hiring or firing, doing it or having it done to you. Roaches and flies or a broken hook on a screen or out of gas or too much gas. <laughs> the seat's stopped up. The landlord's drunk. The president doesn't care. The governor's crazy. Light switch broken. Mattress like a porcupine. $105 for a tune-up. Carburetor and fuel pump at Sears Roebuck. And the phone bill's up. And the market's down. And the toilet chain is broken. light has burned out. The hall light, the front light, the back light, the inner light. It's darker than hell. <laughs> Twice as expensive. Then there's always crabs and ingrown toenails and people who insist they're your friends, there's always that and worse. Leaky faucet, Christ and Christmas, blue salami, nine day rains, 50 cent avocados and purple liverwurst. Or making it as a waitress at Norm's on the split shift or as an emptier of bedpans or as a car wash or a busboy or a stealer of old ladies' purses, leaving them screaming on the sidewalk with broken arms at the age of 80. Suddenly, two red lights in your rearview mirror, and blood in your underwear. Toothache, $979 for a bridge, $300 for a gold tooth, and China, and Russia, and America, and long hair, and short hair, and no hair, and Beards with no faces, and plenty of zigzag, but no pot, except maybe one to piss in, and the other one around your gut. With each broken shoelace, out of 100 broken shoelaces, one man, one woman, one pig enters the madhouse. Careful, bend over. Universal hymn that is beautiful. 
I won't be doing all 52 sections for you guys right now. <laughs> I hope that you guys can still get that sense of view from this poem that I have. This is Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good as belongs to you. I loathe and invite my soul. I lean and loaf, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old and in perfect health, begin hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while, suffice that what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good and bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature without check, with original energy. Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe in the fragrance and know it and like it. The distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. The atmosphere is not a perfume. It is not a taste of the distillation. It is odorless. It is for my mouth forever. I am in love with it. I shall go to the bank by the wood and become undisguised, naked. I am mad for it to be in contact with me. The smoke of my own breath echoes, ripples, buzzed whispers, love root, silk thread, crotch and vine, my respiration and inspiration, the beating of my own heart passing of blood and air through my lungs. The sniff of green leaves and dry leaves, and of the shore and dark colored sea rocks, and of hay in the barn. The sound of the belched words of my voice loose to the eddies of the wind. A few light kisses, a few embraces, reaching around of arms light alone, or in the rush of the streets, or along the hills and fields, the feeling of health, the full noon trill, the song of me rising from bed to meet the sun. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practiced so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You should not take things from second or third hand, nor look from the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters and books. You shall not look from my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. Has anyone supposed that lucky you to be born? I hasten to inform him or her that it is just as lucky to die, and I know it. I pass death with the dying, and birth with a new-washed babe, and cannot be contained between my hat and boots. I peruse manifold objects, no two alike, and every one good. The earth good, the stars good, their adjuncts all good. I am not an earth nor an adjunct of an earth. I am the mate and companion of all people, just as immortal 
and fathomless as myself. They do not know how immortal, but I know. Every kind for itself and its own, for me, mine, male and female, for me, those who have been boys and that love women, for me, the man that is proud and feels how it stings to be slighted, for me, sweethearts and old maids, for me, mothers and the mothers of mothers, for me, lips that have smiled and eyes that have shed tears, for me, children and the begetters of children. <coughs> of the brag by Sharon Olds. I have wanted excellence in the knife room. I have wanted to use my exceptionally strong and accurate arms and my straight posture and quick electric muscles to achieve something at the center of a cloud. The blade piercing the bark deep the haft slowly and heavily vibrating like the cock. I have wanted some epic use for my excellent body, some heroism, some American achievement beyond the ordinary for my extraordinary self. Magnetic and tensile, I have stood by the sandbox and watched the boys play. I have wanted courage. I have thought about fire and the crossing of waterfalls. I have dragged around my belly big with cowardice and safely, my stool black with iron pills, my huge breasts oozing mucus, my legs swelling, my hands swelling, my face swelling and darkening, my hair falling out, my inner sex stabbed again and again with terrible pain, like a knife. I have lain down. I have lain down and sweated and shaken and passed blood and feces and water and slowly, alone, in the center of a circle, I have passed the new person out. And they have lifted the new person free of the act and white, the new person, free of that language of blood like praise all over the body. I have done what you wanted to do, Walt Whitman, <laughs> Allen Ginsberg. I have done this thing, I and the other women. This exceptional act with the exceptional heroic body. This giving birth. This glistening birth. And I am putting my proud American boast right here with the others.
performing excerpts from The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Wilson. Mythology, the Lotus Eaters were a race of people who inhabited an island near North Africa. They existed in peaceful apathy, it was said, because of the narcotic effect of the lotus plants they ate. When Odysseus landed on the island, some of his men ate the lotus plants and wanted to stay there rather than return home to their families. The incident is documented in the ninth book of Homer's Odyssey, The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Lord Tennyson. <clears throat> Courage, he said, and pointed toward the land. This mounting wave will roll us shoreward soon. In the afternoon, they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon. All round the coast, the languid air did swoon breathing like one that hath a weary dream. Full-faced above the valley stood the moon, and like a downward smoke the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem. A land of streams, some, like a downward smoke, slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go, and some through wavering lights and shadows broke, rolling a slumberous sheet foam below. They saw the gleaming river seaward flow from the inner land. Far off, three mountain tops, three silent pinnacles of aged snow stood sunset flush and dewed with showery drops up clomb the shadowy pine above the woven cops. Ah. The charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west. Through mountain clefts, the dale was seen far inland. And many a winding vale and meadow set slender gallon gale, a land where all things always seemed the same. And round about the keel, with faces pale, dark faces pale against that rosy flame, the mild-eyed, melancholy lotus ears Branches they bore, that enchanted stem, laden with flower and fruit, whereof they gave to each, but whoso did receive of them and taste, to him the gushing of the wave, far, far away did seem to mourn and rave on alien shores. And if his fellow spake, his voice was thin as voices from the grave, and deep asleep he seemed, yet all awake, and music in his ears his beating heart did make. They sat them down upon the yellow sand, between the sun and moon, upon the shore. And sweet it was, the dream of fatherland, of wife and child and slave. But evermore most weary seemed the sea, and weary the shore, the oar, weary the wandering fields of barren foam. Then someone said, we will return no more. And all at once they sang, our island home is far beyond the waves we will no longer roam. There is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass, or night dews on still waters between walls with shadowy granite and a gleaming pass. Music that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes. Music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful sky. Here, cool mosses deep, and in the moss the ivies creep, and in the stream the long-leaved flowers weep, and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep. Hateful is the dark blue sky, vaulted over the dark blue sea. Death is the end of life. Ah, why should life all labor be? Let us alone. Time driveth onward fast, and in a little while our lips are dumb. Let us alone. What is it that will last? All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace? 
ever climbing up the climbing wave. All things have rest and ripen toward the grave in silence, ripen, fall, and cease. Give us long rest, or death, dark death, or dreamful ease.